Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Very good. Uh, yeah, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dilip Krishnan, um, who was who completed his PhD uh, under Rob Fergus um, last year uh, and has done a bunch of work that I found uh, interesting over the last several years. Um, you may be aware of the dark flash photography work uh, from a few years ago, but for me at the moment, uh, I'm really interested in, uh, in this work they did on preconditioning for uh, a bunch of problems that occur frequently in graphics and computer vision. Um, for me, preconditioning has always been some uh, black art that I've never properly understood, so I'm hoping Dilip will help us now. Um, oh, I forgot to say, he's currently a postdoc uh, at MIT with Bill Freeman. So welcome, Dilip. Yep. Looking forward to the talk. Yep. Thanks, Andrew, for inviting me, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, so this was work we presented at SIGGRAPH last year. Uh, and basically, as the title suggests, we present an empirically linear time solver for Laplacian matrices, which at some point in the future we hope we can prove that it's actually linear time in construction and solve. So Laplacian matrices arise in a number of uh, applications. Examples from 2D image processing include uh, tone mapping, colorization, and edge preserving decomposition. The coefficients of the Laplacians, which are the entries in the matrix, can range from homogeneous for Poisson blending to highly discontinuous or highly varying for edge preserving decomposition. And solving the linear system is the most time consuming step in all of these applications. Uh, in 3D mesh processing, uh, Laplacians arise in uh, mesh smoothing, reconstruction, diffusion, and segmentation. And uh, one problem is that most existing solvers are limited to two-dimensional regular grids, and therefore they are not applicable to 3D meshes. And we were hoping to build a solver which can be used as a black box across a range of 2D and 3D applications, uh, which would be desirable to have. And outside of uh, graphics and vision, uh, Laplacians arise in a variety of applications such as uh, spectral clustering, uh, the numerical solution of PDEs, which is the classical uh, reason why methods like multigrid uh, uh, and multipole methods for solving integral equations started, and uh, the solution of um, relaxed NP-hard graph partitioning problems such as MinCut. So usually in uh, problems like these, the uh, task is to find the lowest few non-trivial eigenvectors. So our method is directly applicable to these problems since it is agnostic to the underlying application. <clears throat> so why can't we use direct solvers? Well, direct solvers provide exact solutions for sparse linear systems that involve Laplacians. However, they are not linear in the number of unknowns and quite memory intensive. Uh, so naive Gaussian elimination is O of n cube in time, O of n square in memory where n is the number of unknowns. Uh, nobody uses Gaussian elimination actually. They use something called nested dissection, uh, which actually involves uh, some form of graph uh, processing where the unknown system is treated as a graph which is split into two subgraphs uh, and then individually solved and then combined and so forth. Uh, nested dissection methods are what you would use when you run backslash in MATLAB's direct solver. And this is O of uh, n uh, 3 over 2 and O of n log n memory, which is much better than uh, plain old Gaussian elimination. And actually, empirically, it works very well. However, uh, it's still expensive if you get to millions of variables. And the other thing is that we don't, at least in graphics and vision, we don't need, uh, you know, O of 10 to the minus 14 accuracy, uh, 10 to the minus 6 will do, in which case, uh, this opens the door for iterative linear solvers. 
Uh, the main advantage of iterative solvers is that they use only matrix ve vector multiplications, uh, which is therefore O of n in memory and time per iteration. But the number of iterations depends on what is called the condition number of the Laplacian L, which is defined as the ratio of the largest and smallest eigenvalues, non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Um, the condition number of uh, 2D homogeneous Laplacians happens to be a function of uh, the Laplacian size n. Therefore, if we just naively use uh, iterative solvers such as Jacobi, Gauss-Seidel, or conjugate gradients, we still get nonlinear running times, O of n squared or O of uh, n to the 1.5. And this condition number can be significantly larger when we have non-homogeneous uh, Laplacians, and so we need something else to overcome, to, to use iterative solvers effectively. And that's where metrics preconditioning comes in. Um, the idea of preconditioning is simple. It is to transform a problem Lx equal to b to an equivalent system Q inverse Lx equals Q inverse b. And if the condition number of Q inverse L is small, then we can significantly reduce the number of iterations for an iterative solver. So, of course, we want the condition number of Q inverse L to be small. We want the condition number of Q inverse uh, L to be small. However, uh, it, must be, it should be efficient to apply Q inverse to a vector and we should not need an explicit form of Q inverse because otherwise that would involve a matrix inversion which is O of n cubed, so we didn't gain anything at all. So these are the, the key design criteria for a preconditioner. And there have been two main uh, approaches for building preconditioners, uh, multigrid and combinatorial preconditioners. So, Multigrid is the, is the classical framework which has been around for about 30 years now. Uh, it started off with uh, something called geometric multigrid which was defi defined for homogeneous Poisson equations. And what geometric multigrid does is to define the same problem at multiple scales through fixed hierarchies of uh, uh, coarsening. And preconditioning is performed by partially solving the problem at multiple scales from coarse to fine and combining these results. So there have been proofs uh, which show that GMG is known to be optimal for homogeneous Laplacian systems. However, uh, once you have inhomogeneous uh, uh, systems or problems with complicated geometry, its performance can be very poor. So due to this, uh, algebraic multigrade was developed, which uses uh, so, so in, geometric, in GMG, a coarse level operator is defined using geometrical arguments. And as the name suggests, in algebraic multigrid, an algebraic formula is used to define the coarse scale operator. And this is called the Galerkin approach, which uh, just takes a uh, restriction matrix and applies it to the fine level Laplacian. And P transpose LP gives rise to a coarse level matrix. Uh, in, this can be considered as something similar to a Gaussian elimination of certain set, subset of variables in the fine la level Laplacian. So uh, AMG generalizes geometric multigrid to many different types of matrices. However, uh, the key, um, the key uh, trade-off for AMG is uh, the preconditioning ability and efficiency of applying the preconditioner to a vector. On the other hand, uh, combinatorial preconditioners are a relatively new paradigm. They were actually uh, based on a fundamental observation made by Vedya in 90. Um, and actually, for this observation, he, he never actually published any of his uh, work. He just made this observation, and it started this entire field of combinatorial preconditioning. And he just left academia and started a company to make the solvers instead of writing papers about it. Uh, and the, the idea was that a, so he started with the observation that a Laplacian matrix can be associated with a uh, undirected weighted graph, where 
the, the edge weights in the graph are positive. And such Laplacians, which have non-positive uh, off-diagonals, are known as M matrices. And the edge weights in the graph, as you can see here, correspond to the off-diagonal entries of the Laplacian. So the key idea in combinatorial preconditioning is to take the original graph and create a sparser graph, such as a tree, for example, which is quick to invert. And the tree is constructed in such a way that it's, it um, approximates the original, uh, the, the original graph very well. And in the next slide, we'll see what good approximation means. And examples of uh, such preconditioners are a maximum spanning tree or a low stretch spanning tree, which are particular varieties of uh, trees um, that can be constructed from the original graph. And so the guiding example to creating the sparser graph is the energy preservation of vectors. So uh, if, we def if we have a vector x which has values on every vertex of the graph, its energy is defined as x transpose Lx, which can be shown to be uh, this formula, where uh, w uv is the weight of each edge, and x u and x v are the values of uh, uh, x at the endpoints of that edge, or uv. So the upper and lower bounds of this energy uh, define the quality of preconditioning of the associated Laplacian L and Q. So uh, this is a fundamental observation that the condition number of Q inverse L is related to this uh, lower bound and upper bound on the energies of Q. So this is what connects uh, the corresponding Laplacian Q uh, Q and L with their graph versions, uh, you know, with EQ and EL. To achieve a low condition number, however, requires more edges than just a tree. So it turns out that a tree isn't enough. And uh, recent theoretical results uh, by a number of uh, uh, people have shown that uh, you can build um, something which is uh, more than a tree, which has more edges than a tree. It's not a tree anymore. Uh, however, it can be constructed in uh, about O of n log n time. But uh, the drawback is that they've never actually implemented any of these uh, constructions because, um, uh, well, it's not clear why. Maybe it cannot actually work that well in practice, but the theoretical results are very strong. And these are um, leaning towards close to linear uh, construction and solve times. So an important question is why, how does preconditioning help in applications? So here we consider the example of a simple image colorization problem on this spiral. So we want to propagate the uh, red and blue strokes along the arms of the spiral. Uh, if you just use a naive gauss seidel iteration, uh, this is what we get after 300 iterations. So uh, the colors have barely propagated, uh, you know, a little bit. And in fact, if, you, if we now run it for thousands of iterations, it won't make much progress beyond that. So this has been mainly due to the very local nature of Gauss-Seidel propagation. Uh, next, if we use uh, the ABF solver, which uh, was work uh, with uh, Rick Selesky, uh, which we did in 2011, uh, that's a hierarchical cost to fine uh, solver. We can see that it makes much more progress in a single iteration as compared to Gauss Seidel. So the colors get propagated, you know, well along the spiral, but we can see that the red and blue colors start to fade away after, you know, a certain length. Finally, this is the result of propagation with our new uh, uh, preconditioner, which is uh, which we'll show is much better preconditioner than the ABF, and sure enough, so after one iteration, the colors are propagated perfectly. So that's why preconditioning is powerful. It allows us to uh, take care of the low frequency or stiff modes, which correspond to long-range interaction between the unknowns in the system, and the better the preconditioner, the faster this propagation happens across the entire system. So our solver adapts much better to the geometric structure of the problem, and that's why the strokes are propagated much better as compared to ABF or Gauss-Seidel. 
So our solver combines ideas from multigrid and combinatorial preconditioning. Um, the main problem with multigrid in terms of efficiency is the increase in bandwidth at coarser levels. <clears throat> so what we do is to overcome this issue by interleaving the coarsening and with uh, specification steps. So we take the coarsening ideas from the multigrid literature and combine it with the specification ideas from the combinatorial literature. Uh, but instead of starting with a tree as the combinatorial preconditioning uh, literature does, uh, what they do is to start with a tree and then add some edges to it. We start with the original graph and drop some edges. So in practice, this is a much more efficient approach because constructing a tree itself is a O of n log n operation and then adding some edges to it is even more work. So we have something much more local uh, which can be O of n. So, <coughs> so as a result, our solver actually runs uh, fast in practice. So to understand our solver better, let us consider the colorization problem again on this simple image of a spiral. So this is a visualization of the five point Laplacian defined on that uh, spiral. So the edge weights here are inversely proportional to the magnitude of gradients between a pixel and its four nearest neighbors. Stronger edges appear fatter and weaker edges are thinner. Uh, the connections are therefore stronger along the spiral than across it. We first greedily select a, an independent set of fine variables, uh, which are shown here in red. Uh, so no two fine variables share an edge. The complementary set of variables, which is shown in black, will form the coarse level system, which, is, which would be about half the size of the fine level system. Uh, these operations correspond uh, to permuting, these operations essentially correspond to permuting the Laplacian into the coarse and fine variable sets. Then we uh, eliminate the fine variables using Gaussian elimination. So this is the P transpose LP, which is similar to the Galerkin elimination in um, multigrid. And this results in a <coughs> block diagonal matrix uh, where the fine component, in, component is diagonal because none of the fine variables are um, connected to each other. And a coarse level, uh, uh, a coarse level component, which is itself a Laplacian. So now we can recurse on this and create uh, smaller and smaller systems. But uh, just recursing on this using Gaussian elimination will quickly increase the bandwidth or the connectivity. So what we save in terms of the number of variables at the coarse level is offset by the increasing bandwidth of the Laplacian. Uh, so this, this, uh, this is the bandwidth growth problem that is common in multigrid. <coughs> So instead what we do is to uh, use ideas from the combinatorial literature and specify the coarse level matrix. So we remove non-critical edges which are shown here in red. So unlike our uh, previous work which also uses specification, uh, the key difference with uh, our new solver is that the edges which are removed are not regularly uh, spread through the domain. So we choose edges based on a certain criterion uh, which gives a much better preconditioner. And the process of specification reduces the number of connections between variables and the resulting um, specified matrix is also a Laplacian, but it has much, uh, but we are able to control the bandwidth growth in the coarse uh, level matrices. Then we repeat the above steps to form a hierarchy of uh, subproblems. So uh, we mark the fine and coarse variables, eliminate fine variables, specify, and keep doing that until we uh, reach a certain uh, maximum size uh, of system, at which point we can uh, bring in an exact solver to solve it accurately. So now uh, let's analyze this a little more. Uh, which edges do we specify? So the key is that we specify those edges which allow us to maintain a low condition number between the specified matrix Q and the original matrix L. 
So we show in the paper that removing the weakest edge of a triangle allows us to obtain a condition number of three between the specified and unspecified matrices. Therefore, what we do is to search through the graph for all triangles and remove edges with minimal weight until a triangle-free graph is obtained. So in the perfect case that we manage to find independent triangles, this would lead to a condition number of just three between the original and specified graphs. That's not always the case in practice, but uh, this is our starting point. Uh, but now if we just remove, uh, just drop edges, uh, this causes a deterioration in the overall condition number. So we improve this by compensating for the loss of edges. So our compensation formulas take the uh, weight of the dropped edge and add it to the two remaining edges in each triangle. So this leads to a very simple weight update formula. Just drop that edge and add its weight to the other two edges of the triangle. This ensures that the resulting matrix is still a Laplacian. And we've got some justification for this formula in the paper. Um, while we don't have a proof, empirically we observe that the resulting condition number by adding compensation changes from a value of three to about two. Uh, three without compensation and two with compensation. And finally, we use a greedy strategy for the coloring. Uh, so vertices on either end of a dropped edge are marked as fine, which means that two fine variables can never be connected to each other. And the third vertex is marked as coarse. So this ensures that the fine variables are independent. And we observe that on average for 2D images and 3D surface meshes, the number of coarse variables is about 50 to 60% of the overall number of variables. So this means that the uh, hierarchy will eventually terminate. We don't, we don't have a huge number of levels. Uh, it's um, log of uh, O of log N uh, levels. So uh, we just, let's compare our uh, algorithm on this image uh, against the ABF approach to show why a non-geometric uh, approach helps. Uh, the ABF approach has a non-adaptive specification and coloring scheme. So it just takes, uh, it has this, uh, a half octave um, uh, selection, which means that at every uh, step, half the number of variables are chosen as fine and the other half as coarse using a red-black scheme. So it's clearly seen that, uh, so this is the result after a few levels of coarsening, and we see that it no longer uh, follows the geometric structure of the problem. Uh, on the other hand, this is our um, solver's uh, geometry after a few levels of coarsening, and we see that it maintains the shape of the spiral. And this is key to fast diffusion of the solution through the domain that is to maintain the relationship between the strong clusters and not destroy them as we go to the coarse levels. Because these long range connections are the ones that take the longest to be resolved. And you want those to be preserved as long as possible in the hierarchy. So, some results. <coughs> so we first start with, um, homogeneous Laplacians of uh, increasing size. So here's, this is the value of n. We go from one, zero, two, four, all the way to a uh, million. And this is the original condition number. So we see that it's uh, O of n. And this is, the re uh, this is the condition number of Q inverse L. So with the compensation, it's almost constant. And this is what we would expect because in the case of a homogeneous problem, our approach coincides with geometric multigrid, which is known to be optimal uh, in the sense that the condition number does not change with increasing problem size. So <clears throat> uh, one thing to note is that without the compensation, that is adding the uh, dropped edge to the other two edges of the triangle, the condition number does not stay constant because that's not geometric multigrid. Uh, it slowly increases as problem size increases which means you need more and more iterations for larger problem sizes. 
So we call our solver HSC for hierarchical, specify, and compensate. Uh, so here we consider some linear systems arising in 2D problems, uh, edge high dynamic range compression, colorization, edge preserving decomposition. Here we show condition numbers of a number of different methods. Um, these are state-of-the-art multigrid methods, combinatorial multigrid, lean algebraic multigrid, and algebraic multigrid. ABF is our previous work, and GMG is geometric multigrid. Uh, so we are able to reduce the condition number from oh, you know, a million, over a million to less than 10. Uh, the top performing methods are shown in bold in each row. And in all cases, so this, this goes from homogeneous uh, slightly less homogeneous and highly discontinuous, in all cases we are able to reduce the condition number significantly. Uh, and here are actual wall clock times. So uh, this is not very useful if, if the solver takes a long time. So here we compare uh, these problems, uh, and this, these are the number of uh, unknowns, so millions of variables, to the direct solver in MATLAB as well as the other methods. Uh, where, this, where it did not converge within a reasonable time is where uh, we don't show any results. So we achieve about 2x to uh, about 8x speed up over the direct solver and uh, about two times faster than, uh, well, 1.5 times faster than combinatorial multigrid, which is uh, a state of the art combinatorial preconditioning based method. Uh, now we compare the, against the direct solver for two applications in 3D mesh processing. So this is geodesic distance computation. So here the idea is to find uh, the distances from a target point on the 3D mesh. Uh, and red is closer, blue is further away. Uh, and this is done by diffusion. So uh, a, a single point is marked as the source point, and then heat diffusion is performed for uh, a certain number of time steps, and this gives us the distance. Uh, so we measure that for a number of meshes of different sizes, and that's the time taken for, uh, by the backslash, and this is our setup and solve time. So in terms of the solve time, we are up to 16 to 20 times faster than the direct solver. Uh, and here's an example of mesh denoising, where uh, uh, it's, it's basically a smoothing process. And here we tested for uh, meshes up to 14 million vertices in size and achieve a similar speed up of somewhere between 3 to uh, 20 times faster. Computing the smallest eigenvectors of a matrix uh, uses repeated linear system solves. So our solver can therefore also be used to accelerate eigensolvers. Uh, what we do for that is to use a cost to fine uh, scheme where we take the closest level Laplacian that we generate by a hierarchy, compute the lowest few eigenvectors on that, propagate it up to the finest level, and then refine it at the finest level through some uh, smoothing. So here's an example of uh, segmentation, and uh, we can get about a 2x speed up over MATLAB IGS. And um, unlike IGS, our solver is very easy to code up, and then it's, it's amenable to GPU acceleration, for example. Whereas MATLAB's IGS, which is based on you know, some Langchos type methods, may be much more difficult to, uh, to, to code in, on GPUs. So here we show the error reduction as a function of uh, iteration. Our solver is shown in black. So this is the error of the, uh, this is the residual of the system, which is uh, the norm of B minus LX, where, when we are solving LX equal to B. And uh, <coughs> for different problems, HDR compression, colorization, and edge preserving decomposition, so we can see that the error uh, drops significantly you know, at every iteration. And uh, within 10 to 20 iterations, we achieve a error relative residual of about 10 to the minus six. So in the paper, we also show a simple heuristic which allows us to quickly update the preconditioner for diagonally shifted versions of the original Laplacian. 
And this situation often arises in practice. So it's, uh, I, uh, I think it's an interesting empirical tool for solving uh, systems repeatedly. Uh, so finally, cotangent Laplacians are uh, widely used in uh, mesh processing. And uh, when we submitted the SIGGRAPH paper, some of the reviewers didn't like the fact that we never mentioned cotangent Laplacians. And the main problem is that these are not M matrices uh, because of the way the edge weights are computed. Those are cotangents of uh, angles. And when the, uh, so the edge weight for this edge, for example, is the sum of the cotangents of the angles opposite the edge. And if that angle is obtuse, then uh, there's a, uh, some edges can have negative weights. And so none of the, actually none of the existing multigrid methods or very few of the existing multigrid methods work well. And none of the combinatorial methods work for non-M matrices. So in its original form, our method cannot be directly used. But what we do is to simply drop some of the positive off diagonals and create a new M matrix and then build a preconditioner on that M matrix and just use that as a preconditioner for the original non-M matrix. So this is a heuristic, but uh, in practice it works quite well and it has been used in the multigrid community. Uh, empirically, it gives us good results for uh, mesh processing problems. So here we compare to uh, the direct solver for, um, uh, uh, for meshes of uh, increasing size and we get about a 20 to 30 times speed up for matrices of this type as well and while using significantly less uh, memory. Uh, so one of the problems with the direct solver is that uh, uh, the memory usage goes up significantly so it's many gigs for a mesh of this size. So we use less than a third of that memory. So details can be, um, uh, uh, so uh, this is not in the paper, the cotangent Laplacian result, but the uh, details are, uh, but we provide examples in our test code on how to use this. So in summary, uh, we've developed an efficient solver for Laplacian linear systems which can be used in a variety of uh, 2D and 3D problems, including cotangent Laplacians. And the key is to combine ideas from the multigrid literature on uh, uh, hierarchy, um, building hierarchies and specification steps from the combinatorial preconditioning literature. And the result is a solver that is fast in wall clock time. And uh, there's code on this web page if you'd like to try it. Uh, future work will involve uh, better extensions to non-M matrix Laplacians. So, so in the case of cotangent Laplacians, it works fine. But when we try it for other um, kinds of uh, matrices which involve very long range uh, derivatives, uh, higher order derivatives, I'm sorry, uh, then we find that uh, our construction doesn't work well. Uh, actually, sometimes it just <coughs> fails because the resulting um, if you just drop the positive edges, then we just get a very poor preconditioner. If we don't drop the positive edges, the resulting preconditioner just uh, is not uh, positive definite anymore, so it just doesn't work. So we'd like to tackle that problem. And we'd like to derive some theoretical guarantees on how good our solver is, whether we are actually linear time in construction for a wide variety of problems. Um, and finally, we'd like to consider other applications that use Laplacians, not just in, uh, you know, uh, in the particular applications we've considered here. So, yeah, thank you. So, okay, what, yeah, so quite, yeah, any questions? Yeah. Well, I think you want to ask mine. Um, <clears throat> So you talk about you know the setup and solve. Yes. Uh, obviously, you can reuse the setup if you're solving with the same left hand side. Yes. You can reuse it if you update the diagonal. Yes. Um, uh, I should uh, qualify that only if the diagonal is updated with a po um, positive scale. So so if the diagonal is updated so that the resulting matrix uh, the scalar which is it's. 
sorry, if the diagonal is updated with a single scalar, that's all we've tested it with. So something like L plus T times identity. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And what happens if you don't, if you just use the, the old wrong condition, preconditioner? So we update the diagonal. Right. Uh, uh, it just depends on the value of T. Yeah. So the closer it is to zero, the better the preconditioner, then as you go further and further away, uh, the con condition number will just deteriorate. Um, and at some point, it will just take many, ten, you just take more and more and more iterations to get. But does it sort of fall off a cliff or does it linearly increase the number of iterations? Uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't fall off a cliff. Uh, it just, well, okay, that's hard to, it probably will fall off a cliff at some value of t when something funny happens to the system at coarser levels. I mean, maybe, uh, so what happens is you have this diagonal, its effect is starting to diffuse at the next levels and we are ignoring that basically. So at some point there might be some phase change and it could fall off a cliff. So uh, I'd say you probably can't have t too large a value of T before it would break down, yes. So I haven't tested it you know, accurately for different value, for, for this phase change behavior, but it could happen. You mentioned you wanted to prove various promises. Right. Now, what are the challenges for that? To, to prove? prove? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so um, the key thing is, we, so first of all, we want to prove that, um, um, so we are using V-cycle iterations, which uh, if you're familiar with multi-grid literature, that means the way we solve it is uh, you go from fine, uh, you, you do some smoothing, then find the residual, take it to the coarse level, do some smoothing, take it to the coarse level, do some smoothing, et cetera, go down all the way, then go back up all the way. And so this is one V cycle, and that reduces the error B minus LX by a little bit. And then we just keep repeating V cycles till uh, we have a error below a predefined threshold. Those are the iterations I was showing for the error reduction. So now the question is, uh, if you have any different kind of matrix and will our preconditioner make, ensure that this V cycle will converge? So we keep reducing the error at every iteration. The existing, the problem is we don't know yet whether you could have a blow up of the error at the coarser levels. We haven't proved it. We're just seeing it empirically, but it could happen that your error just doesn't decrease for certain kinds of graphs. And then you'd have to do hundreds and hundreds of smoothing iterations to, uh, or thousands to reduce the error. The combinatorial preconditioning guys, so they use something called a W cycle. So they control the error at every iteration, at every level by solving. So at every level, instead of just doing smoothing, um, so at this level, there's a full V cycle. Then at the next level, there's another V cycle which goes down and up. And at the next level, there's another V cycle. So that's called a W cycle. So it's significantly more expensive, but they can show that if the coarsening rate is fast enough, then the overall cost is O of N. But our coarsening rate is only uh, 50%. So if we do a W cycle, we are no longer linear. So it's this trade-off between how well we can keep the condition number controlled from one level to the next versus the size of the system at the coarse level. And the peak conditioner guys, uh, the combinatorial guys, they can, um, have these theoretical proofs about, uh, uh, you know, uh, that they can cut it from, they can cut, they can control uh, how fast they can coarsen and trade that off against how much time they spend solving. Uh, we don't have that in our current system. So we have to find a way to take their proofs and translate it into our language where we can't control the rate of coarsening as well as they do. So if you spend the time to do a W cycle, you would nearly have a proof. Yes, exactly. But as it stands right now, at 50% coarsening rate, we couldn't do that. Uh, it would not be linear anymore, for sure. It would be n log n at that point. Uh, but if we could somehow, yeah, exactly. That's right. So if we could use a W cycle, we are done. Uh, or if we could, uh, yeah, then we are done. Or if we could ensure that the condition number is, say, one point, you know, epsilon. And then we show that this one point epsilon cannot blow up as you have log n levels, then we are done too. 
but if you have condition number of two and you have log n levels, then you have two to the log n, which could be O of n. So that's the general. Uh, can I just ask one more? Suppose I have the general symmetry positive definite matrix. Right. It's, you know, the Laplacian plus something. Right. Um, you know, am I completely out of luck or? Um, so it's, is, so by Laplacian, I guess you mean an M matrix here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Plus, and what's the plus something? Is it diagonal or? Uh, maybe simplish structure, maybe local interactions. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm very interested to explore those kinds of systems. Uh, the short answer is I'm not sure. Um, but again, if the system is just a small perturbation of the Laplacian, it seems like you should be able to reuse all the work for the Laplacian and do a little bit more to get L plus something solved. Uh, on the other hand, it depends on the structure of this additional guy. Is, I mean, is there a literature on this today? Or? No, so in fact, this is a very hot topic in, uh, apparently, I don't know, but I heard it from uh, some applied math guy that this is the big topic, uh, updating preconditioners, where they want to have cheap updates for uh, instead of having to rebuild everything. So right now everything is very static. You change your matrix by one entry, you just recompute everything, which seems uh, uh, inefficient. Mm -hmm. So there isn't much out there, actually. So I was, when I was doing the heuristic for the updated diagonal, I searched for a lot of the literature and there isn't even anything on that. Uh, so for a general matrix, there might be even less. There, there wasn't anything, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.